Hey Cherubs, it's Matt. A lot of trainees ask me, how would you like me to present? And there's never a clear-cut answer. This is one aspect of the art of medicine, and like it or not, this is part of how we evaluate you. But I think that at their core, all presentations are attempts to persuade. Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? Let's talk about new patients and new problems first. Your goal is to sell me your assessment and plan. Pretend it's Friday night, and you want to borrow the car because you have a date. But your sister, Rachel, already asked me to borrow the car, and I know for a fact that she's going to do something useful with it. So you need to build a compelling case. This date of yours needs to be amazing. And when I ask you why she doesn't have a rib cage, you need to have a cogent response ready. As soon as you open your mouth during a presentation, differentials are going to start popping into my head. And so it's your job to anticipate those differentials and what kind of information I need to lead me to your diagnosis and rule out those differentials. If you do this correctly, by the end of your presentation, I can't help but agree with your assessment, and then you follow it up with an expertly researched plan, preferably one that involves you giving me chocolate. How much information do you need to say? Well, it depends on the situation. Calling for a consult? Not a lot. Morning report? Gonna want more substance. Now, that doesn't mean your presentation should be filled with irrelevant information. Your audience should always have some questions for you. If not, you probably put them to sleep. There's always going to be some backseat driver asking some esoteric question. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? You don't need to state the patient's favorite food during the presentation, but have the answer ready in case someone asks. Who do you know so much about swallows? Well, you have to know these things when you're a king, you know. Differentials. Now, sometimes you won't know the final diagnosis when it comes time to present, and that's fine. Medicine contains a lot of uncertainties, pretest probabilities, positive predictive values. You know, that's why differentials exist. So, what should you put on your list? Well, everyone has a different way of doing this. Some people use mnemonics, some people go by organ system. I usually use the following. Number one, what's the most likely diagnosis? What do you think the problem is? Number two, what's the second most likely diagnosis? Alternatively, common things being common, what would be the most common diagnosis? Number three, what are the diagnoses that you absolutely need to rule out? I.e., what's going to kill the patient? Number four, what's the diagnosis that would be easily treatable? Now, this could be a long shot and require some overly optimistic thinking, but hey, if you fix something that's easily treatable, that's an easy way to go from feeling like a zero to a hero. Number five, zebras. Now, as the saying goes, when you hear hoofbeats, you should think of horses, but if you never consider zebras, you'll never diagnose them. Plans. Now, obviously, you should do your homework and research how to manage the patients, but sometimes it's helpful to organize your plan into basic categories. First, we have workup. What kinds of tests do you want to order to confirm your diagnosis and rule out the dangerous differentials? Next, we have treatment. What meds are you going to prescribe, or what procedures will you perform? Last but not least, patient education. There's no point in buying me 20 pounds of spaghetti if I don't know how to boil water first. Same thing is true for meds. This isn't going to do me any good if I don't know how to use it. Now let's talk about chronic problems, established diagnoses. I usually ask the trainees about the four C's. First one is compliance. Is your patient adhering to their prescribed medication regimen? If the blood sugars are high because the patient doesn't have enough money to buy insulin, then increasing the dose of insulin isn't going to fix the problem. Second is control. Is the problem under good control? And according to whose standard? See, it's one thing to say that Dr. Uechi says the patient is doing well, and Dr. Uechi is my supervisor, so we're going to do what he says. It's another thing to say that based on guidelines from the American Diabetes Association, the patient's hemoglobin A1c is within goal. Citing the study or the guideline that you're following lends credence to your plan. Third is complications. Are there long-term sequelae of this problem for which we should be monitoring? And the fourth is chocolate. Wait, there's no chocolate? Rachel, you can use the car!